Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. In the last episode, we discussed the uh, setting for the rise of the anti-abortion movement among evangelicals. We took a look at how evangelicalism has not always held uh, as tightly as it does to abortion as a um, single determining issue in politics. In fact, there was there was quite a bit of disagreement as to when abortions were permissible, and some even coming out of Dallas Theological Seminary, who said that uh, you know it always seemed that uh, kids were not valuable, fetuses were not valuable until they were born; they didn't become human persons. Uh, we spoke about Christianity Today and some of the the uh, like the Southern Baptist Convention and and all kinds of different different um, things that just painted a picture that is very different than we see today, where it seems like the Christian right is univocal in in their stance against abortion and in their determination of how important abortion is in the sense that it is able to drown out any other significant issue whatsoever, um, whether that's race, poverty, whatever, abortion trumps everything. And we looked at some of the, the motivating factors for what was able to pull um, pull this contingency together, this religious right, uh, and why abortion became so important. And one of the influencers was the fact uh, that during this time in our history, the many institutions um, who were trying to avoid desegregation, had created their own schools and were starting to lose government funding um, and government kickbacks because they refused to integrate. And so we took a look at the influence that race had uh, in in um, kind of this pushback against the government and how abortion was able to be a unifying factor for uh, both churches in the North and South as race would not be able to unify the two. In this episode then, I want to kind of continue that discussion a little bit by looking at the the demographics of abortion, especially the the racial demographics. If we're going to talk about the influence of race, um, I think it would be good to start taking a look at uh, also how how races are affected differently in terms of how abortion plays out in the real world. So let's dive in. In what seems to me to be a a great irony, Jerry Falwell recently denied the racist history of a good portion of the Republican Party and evangelicalism. And after he did this, uh, at at some point, he ended up uh, also recently donning a mask depicting the Virginia governor in blackface and said that it's the liberals who are actually racists, not the conservatives. Now, Falwell, I imagine, like most evangelicals, views abortion as a prime example of how Republicans are fighting racial injustice, while liberals are perpetuating it. And that, that's because, statistically speaking, minorities are, um, are at higher risk for having abortions. And so fighting abortion to people like Falwell and uh, other evangelicals is seen as actually fighting racial injustice, which is targeting minorities. Um, Ignoring all of the things that we could say about Falwell and the evangelical community and its racism, uh, which, just a side note, I'd recommend reading uh, The Color of Compromise, which does a really good job of of kind of looking through uh, racism specifically in the church, and this is written, uh, I believe it's by somebody in the the PCA, which uh, is my denomination, a very conservative denomination, um, th- that would be a good resource for you to take a look at. But yeah, Falwell's wrong. We've been racist and still uh, support racist policies or just ignore uh, racism. But that's beside the point. Today we're going to look at um, some of the statistics of, of abortion and kind of talk about some of those implications uh, specifically for, for the church. Just one little side note before I do go in. Um, this uh, this episode 
um, is one where I feel like I am out of my ken more so than others because um, while researching like abortion and adoptions and, and other types of things, it, it you can get so many different sources and so many different um, different numbers that all seem to say about the same thing, but numbers change from year to year and, and some data only goes up to like 2010 and some will go up to like 2016. And it, it's very difficult, like with my with my science brain, to to get things where it's all uh, all equivalent, all of the data equivalent. So rather than considering this episode as something where I am just giving you uh, what I feel is uh, something set in stone, uh, this information that is um, exactly as it is. Consider this a, a moving target because data does change from year to year and this will be a good jump start for you to kind of look into where to research in the future. So as you want to look up more statistics, as you want to uh, fine tune your understanding of this issue, I hope that I give you good talking points and research points, um, but but know that this is a moving target with with a lot of complexity. And so there's a lot of legwork that you're going to have to do. Uh, I'm just giving you kind of a, a broad overview of what I think are some, some of the major ideas. All right, so in 1980, there were a total of 1,301,000 legal abortions reported to the CDC from 50 states and the District of Columbia. And actually, I think that was 1981, actually. Now, this is less than a 1% increase over the number reported for 1980. So, in 1980 and 1981, that means that there were about uh, 24 to 25 abortions per 1,000 women in the United States aged 15 to 44. Now, compare that number to 2016, where you've got about 11 and a half abortions per woman in the United States. And we see that we have a vastly different landscape than we did in 1980 and 1981. So I want to take a look at, at what I think are some really important statistics um, from 1981 to about 2015, 2016. And I want to highlight some other really important statistics. Because not only have abortions decreased by more, over half, um, but we've got a, a, a huge demographic shift as well. First, women who abort are getting older. So we had 41.3% of women, uh, I'm sorry, 63% of women were under 25 in 1980-81, and now the under 25 group is about 41%. If we would go back to the 1970s, the early 1970s, it's even more dramatic, going from about 33% of women getting abortions who are under 20 to only 10% who are under 20 today. So abortion today is not the uh, teenage escape hatch that is, is usually um, kind of depicted by a lot of conservatives. Um, it's not this, this conservative escape hatch. It's something uh, that is happening as women get older and older. And we can certainly talk about the potential reasons for that, but uh, right now we just want to observe. Women uh, who had abortions used to be primarily white, going from 70% 30 years ago, uh, 40 years ago, to 40% today who are non-Hispanic white. And that is a change that is not substantiated by um, or not explained by a cultural demographic shift because we haven't had a decrease in the white population of 30% in the last 40 years. So here's what I would pull out of these, these statistics so far. It seems clear that the women getting abortions aren't scared white teenagers with the prospect of their bright futures disappearing, but an older group largely above 25, a group of minorities. 
And since sexual activity hasn't really decreased over the decades, although the amount of partners has, um, we've got some something that needs to be explained here um, a, as to why this is largely affecting minorities when it didn't used to. Now, the, the conservative explanation is going to be that the rise in minority abortions is malicious, uh, and it's, it's malicious on the part of liberals. See, they say, those liberals claim that they, uh, they love diversity and they are for minorities, but they're the ones pushing this agenda that seeks to kill minority children. And uh, they often point to like Margaret Sanger back in the day uh, and her desire to, uh, I think she was on board with eugenics and such, and her desire to get rid of minorities um, as, as far as the claim goes. Um, and so they, they say that this is the current modern-day liberal agenda. There, there are a number of problems with this, and I want to, to point those out. So first of all, this this narrative does not account for the significant decrease in white abortions, right? So the total abortions per 1,000 live births in the 70s was as high as 360, 360 abortions per 1,000 live, live births, and 70% of those were white. Whereas today, I believe it's only like 180 uh, abortions per live birth, and the vast majority are not white. So not only has the number been cut by about half, the number of abortions, but uh, while the number of abortions has stayed the same, the percentage of white people has, has dropped. So this, this narrative that they've, it's always been the liberals who are out to get um, minorities just doesn't make sense because that's not, that's not how it was set up. Um, Second, it, this doesn't fit the narr- uh, the information doesn't fit the narr- uh, conservative narrative of liberals catering to the poor because liberals, if they cared about the vote and were just trying to get the vote, they would want more poor babies, not less, right? They'd want more minorities, not less. Um, it reminds me of Jesus's uh, Jesus's you know house divided cannot stand against itself. You really think that? Um, that it's in the the liberals best interest to cut their voting base third the narrative fails to align with the fact that most liberals are trying to curb abortion via health care and birth control expansion which tends to be blocked by conservatives so it seems like the increase in abortions among minorities as a percentage is less about a targeting of minorities and more about a decrease in whites having abortions. Let me explain what I mean by that, uh, and let's look at some data to show this. So in 1980, when you had 360 abortions per 1,000 live births, and 30% of those were non-white, the minority ratio of abortions was about 108 per 1,000. In 2015, with 188 abortions per 1,000, and now it's 63%, which were non-white, the ratio of minority abortions is 118 per 1,000. And so what it seems like we're seeing is that um, we don't have an increase in minorities seeking abortions. What we have is we have a decrease in whites seeking abortions. Because the minority abortion rate is still largely the same. It's it's almost static from the 1970s to today. Considering that minority groups have grown and that the uh, a little bit, and that the white abortions per 1,000 live births fell from 252 per 1,000 live births down to 70, there's something else going on, right? It's not Democrats seeking um, seeking to exterminates the minorities. What the non-conservatives are going to argue is that a lack of access to birth control is really a huge part of this. Over half of those who abort are impoverished or low income 
despite the fact that a lack of access and prohibitive costs make this number lower than it otherwise would be, the U.S. has a larger share of abortions due to unplanned pregnancies than do many other countries. And what I mean by that, because you might say, well, what, what, for what other reason would you have an abortion than an unplanned pregnancy? Um, if, if a child has birth defects or if their, their mother's health is in danger and those sorts of things, those are reasons that, that people have abortions as well. And um, what some of the information seems to indicate is that there are a lot of other countries, particularly countries like in Europe um, that might be on a similar standard of living, where you don't have as many unplanned pregnancies. Um, it's more abortions um, as a result of uh, unexpected events in pregnancy. Um, anyway, so that's what we mean by, by unplanned pregnancies. So if that's true, abortions then, uh, uh, at least as liberals would argue, uh, and it seems as the data would play out, is tied in large part to an access to health care, which in the States, at least, is generally linked to income. And this might explain why a lot of Western European countries with socialized health care, despite being less religious, right, they're more pro-sex and they're less concerned about a, a fetus and abortion stigma, they, they tend to have lower abortion rates, which seems antithetical to the conservative evangelical argument that, you know, we're a godless uh, people if we accept abortion, um, yet we're a Christian nation, while at the same time the lesser Christian nations are having less abortions. Um, that just seems a little bit odd to me, especially considering that those nations are socialistic, which is definitely antithetical to God, right? Um, but yet they have lower abortion rates. Why is that? Well, because when you're in a socialistic country, everybody has access to health care. So most Democrats, most liberals are going to argue that abortion is not ideal and desirable. They don't want people to have abortions either. And access to birth control at reduced costs or free, especially to the poor, is linked in some studies and data to significantly reduced rates of abortion. In that sense, abortion may be seen as a measure of social justice. Where you see a higher abortion rate, you likely see a less educated populace and a poorer one with limited access to health care. And that's why rates for whites have declined, while not for minorities. The standard of living for minorities and the systemic racism and oppression has uh, had a, a larger impact on, on them and their maintaining of their, um, uh, their tendency towards poverty. So in all of this, well, I'm not necessarily advocating birth control as a moral choice for Christians, which, which would be a completely separate discussion. And I can recognize the, the disparities and its correlation with abortion. Um, and that it's not as simple as just saying, don't abort. Uh, there's, there's a lot that's going on here in this data that isn't as conservatives want to think it is. So if these assessments are correct, and if we couple this with the tendency of conservatives to be dismissive of racial issues or at least unwilling to move beyond the surface of the issue to the root. Um, and if we also look at our racially unjust history, uh, again, I recommend the, the Color of Compromise as a, a great starting point to look at this, uh, then I think conservative Christians, we've, we've got a significant problem here. Minorities are getting more abortions than whites, but that's because whites are wealthier and have better access to birth control. And white people tend to have a, a bigger cushion. But conservative policy seeks to limit health care. It attacks education, which is an abstinence-only education. It pulls kids out of public schools, which is where all of the poor kids have to go, and largely minority kids um, are, are stuck there. It reduces welfare 
uh, the, the conservative platform tends to reduce welfare and social benefits for families, and the list just goes on. So from fiscal policy and social policy to moral posturing and a failure to support racial reconciliation and hear out the complaints of people who feel oppressed, conservatives end up fostering and perpetuating an environment where abortions among minorities significantly outnumber uh, proportionally those of whites. We claim that we have a problem with abortion, but we foster the environment that makes abortion exist. Of course, abortion will always exist when it's legal. That's, uh, I think that's an inevitability. But certainly we foster its existence to the extent that it exists. So what should we do about it then? Conservatives encourage adoption as an option, but you know, such a solution is really only a pseudo-solution much, much of the time. See, the majority of adoptive parents, though it's changing, uh, have been white, and the majority of children adopted is white. Um, national adoption, not foreign adoption, of course. Um, and while the trends are changing and always shifting, it is much harder for minority women to find adoptive parents. Now, for as, as big of a problem as Christians say that we have with abortion, and for as laudable as it is that Christians adopt at twice the rate of others in the States, um, that adoption rate among practicing Christians is only 5%. Five percent of Christians adopt. Now I was talking with a friend, and and he kind of chided me and said, "Hey, look, be a little bit more realistic because, um, I think that that number would be higher if it didn't cost so much." And he he explained to me the cost of of even local adoption, and so I think that is, I'm sure there would be more that would that would adopt, um, but my pushback to that would be. Okay, then, if, it, if this is really the Holocaust, we say it's the Holocaust. Conservative evangelical Christians say that this is even worse than the Holocaust because we've had 60 million babies killed so far. Then why wouldn't churches be pumping as much money as they could into adoption? Why would that not be one of the biggest priorities? It's the biggest priority in terms of our politics and how we vote, but it's not the biggest in terms of how we spend our money in the church. Now, if that doesn't strike you as ironic slash hypocritical, um, I think it should. We give lip service to its importance, but but we're not funding it by and large. So yeah, funding might deter families, individual families, but at the same time, it seems like if this is such a big Christian priority, it shouldn't be difficult to scrape up the funding uh, with our standards of living and all the things that we could cut from our lives and the different ways that our churches could spend money. We could easily get money for all of the parents who wanted to adopt. And that number of practicing Christians who adopt uh, out of the Holocaust, the modern day Holocaust, should be more than 5%. And I'm talking to myself here because... Um, We've been convicted that, that we need to adopt. I mean, we say that it's important. We need to do it. We've started an adoption fund, and we're, we're putting money into it each month. But I know how easy it is to shift money around and stuff. So I, I hope that I can come back in five or ten years from now and say that we, we have adopted. Um, but at the moment, I'm one of the 95% of, of people uh, who haven't adopted, and I'm, I'm one of the hypocrites who calls it out and hasn't done it. Um, but, but just to, to even show how, how reasonable I think this is, we have had a group come into our church called the 111 Initiative. And they, they did this wonderful presentation where they said that, look, with the number of kids in foster care who are eligible for adoption and the number of churches, we have more churches than we have kids needing adoption. If every one church would have one family adopt one kid in the United States, there would be no children in need of adoption. 
they'd all be adopted. Now, if that isn't convicting to the church to consider that we have, um, I, I don't remember the number, like 150,000 kids in adoption uh, in foster care, or whatnot. I don't, I don't remember the number, but, um, I mean, goodness gracious, if we could, if we could take care of it that easily, why don't we? And um, that just shows you the feasibility. It's not like your church would have to adopt 50 kids. It's every one church adopt one kid. That's manageable. No excuse. You know, keeping all of these things in mind, it makes me think back to one of our, our season one episodes. I think it was the, the second episode of Romans 13. And I defended the idea that government is not the ethic for the world, but the church is. And I stole that from Stanley Hauerwas. Uh, Hauerwas would say that. You know, this I, I think it shows the importance of spending our resources on the kingdom, big K kingdom, rather than wasting it on on vying for power, trying to legislate abortion versus trying to set a tangible example to our community that shows them that there are loving parents who are willing to adopt and that the the end of the line for their kid is wouldn't be an orphanage or foster care but it would be a family i think that would say more than vitriol each election cycle and would certainly do more not only to change the landscape but also to change hearts because we'd be putting our money where our mouth is now you probably disagree with me on that conclusion which is fine most people most uh conservative evangelicals do but if you do think that the political sphere is a reasonable way to spend your social, temporal, and financial capital, then let's take a look at what a pragmatism in that sphere might entail. You want to be pragmatic, great, I disagree, or consequentialist, great, you do that. Uh, I disagree with you, and we've got a whole season on it. Um, but let's talk about what that would look like for you, what I think it should look like. It seems like access to health care including, and especially birth control and sex education, has a significant impact on the number of abortions. If Republicans would fight for better health care, what might that do to abortion numbers? And what might that do to their respectability and camaraderie across the aisle? If they would work with their Democratic friends on health care, um, and if they would say, the lives of poor people matter to us, and we're going to show that through health care. What might that do to bipartisanship and the ability to pass meaningful legislation at, while at the same time reducing abortions? Poverty is linked also with less education um, beyond just less access to health care. But it's also linked to more broken families and broken structures which leads to higher rates of unplanned pregnancies, children out of wedlock, children with mothers who feel that they can't take care of them, etc. If Republicans would fight against poverty, what might that do to abortion numbers? And what might that do to their respectability and camaraderie across the aisle? If Republicans seriously addressed poverty, what might that do? What about like zones and structures? Because Poverty, violence, and instability are often regional. You can point out zones in cities or regions in states where, where these things exist, and many times they exist as a result of structural or systemic injustice, like redlining or oppressive and opportunistic zoning laws and gerrymandering. What would it look like if Republicans acknowledged systemic injustice and sought to fix the structures which are in place that oppress and perpetuate poverty as well as create it? Republicans are also fighting to keep homosexuals from adopting, while only 5% of practicing Christians adopt. Do Christians really think that the foster system is better for a kid than a gay household? Why don't they say this about most other things they deem sins, like smoking in a household, or households of a second marriage? Why are they qualified to adopt, while a homosexual isn't? Or, what about a non-Christian household? Should non-Christians be able to adopt. They're living in atheism, in antagonism against God. Should they not be able to adopt? So all of this is just to say that while I understand the desire 
to outright ban abortion. Legislation is multifaceted. Most conservative Christians are fighting against a variety of legislations which we are confident would lead to a significant decrease in abortions. It seems to me that we should be pursuing every avenue available to decrease abortions, which would include fighting for health care against poverty and doing the hard work of adopting adoption and community work ourselves. So again, while my political stance might be a bit different in that um, I'm more convinced of abstention from the political system, uh, if you are going to claim that politics is necessary uh, to use here against abortion, I think you need to consider what that looks like. Because it's not just picking a party who fosters the environment which creates abortions. Um, it's, it's calling that party to be wholly pro-life. Because by fostering a truly pro-life country, um, that's going to do a lot more for people's hearts and for um, minimizing abortions than, uh, than it is to just try to slap legislation on it. You know, and uh, w one of the, the great ironies of this is that conservatives are going to say that while they can't change the heart, they can fight for injustice by protecting the victim, right? The, the baby. We can't make the mother love the baby, but we can at least create a legislation that will protect the victim. Yet, why don't they want to embrace higher taxes then? Social programs. Why don't they want to embrace those as conservatives? Because they say you can't legislate generosity. That's a heart issue. You can't legislate the heart. Clearly, by that double standard, justice is only applicable if it doesn't cost us anything. We can't change the mother's heart, yet recognize that we're protecting a baby through legislation. Um, but at the same time, we can't legislate generosity because who legislating generosity can't fix the heart, right? We can't legislate generosity. But it, this isn't about generosity. This isn't about uh, who deserves what, uh, what money that they make. This is about justice, right? Um, we're talking about the poor, the oppressed, those who have been uh, the, the recipients of systemic injustice. If you can legislate abortion, you can legislate taxation and, uh, and giving for the cause of justice. You know, we say that we want to stop abortion, but there's something that we want even more. We want to avoid looking at systemic and structural racism baked into our society, and we want to avoid giving up our power. That's why we'll fight tooth and claw to mandate that others do what others do with their bodies, while fighting with the same vigor to prevent those in need from touching our money. Abortion is way more complicated than they're bad and we're good. It highlights the evil and selfishness in us all, as I think the last episode and this episode just begin to show. But most sadly, it highlights that we don't really love justice, mercy, and humility. We want to give to the Lord that which costs us nothing. That's all for now. So peace, because I'm a pacifist. When I say it, I mean it.